Today we're going to look at the history of Pol Pot, the Cambodian genocide. As head of the Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot put a third of Cambodia's population to death. In parallel with this terrifying genocide, he returned the country to the Stone Age by setting fire to libraries, banning the use of drugs, and punishing with death even the wearing of glasses. 1. Hellish Utopia In 1949, Pol Pot, who was a bad student, won a scholarship to study radio engineering in France. Given his lack of interest, the grant was withdrawn. But those three years and three months in the French capital were not entirely fruitless for the young Cambodian. In Paris, Pol Pot discovered Stalin and began to take an interest in the French Communist Party, drawing closer to the Khmer Marxist circle along with some compatriots who would prove crucial in the future Cambodian terror regime, such as Ieng Sari, Kyu Sampan, Son Sen, and Huo Yuan. The latter would become one of the ideologues of the future democratic Kampuchea and would be as responsible as Pol Pot for the Holocaust perpetrated there. It was the year 1970 when, with the support of the United States, Cambodian General Lan Nol staged a coup to seize power, until then in the hands of Prince Sihanouk. The Khmer Rouge, which had started out as a guerrilla group and was derogatorily so named by Sihanouk himself, the Khmers were the ancient civilization of that country, a people capable of creating such impressive monuments as the temples of Angkor had a new enemy to face. The fighting lasted until April 1975, when rebels entered the country's capital, Phnom Penh. General Knoll fled Cambodia with a million dollars under his arm. Two lies, sidewalks, and labor camps. On April 17, 1975, the Khmer Rouge, dressed in the distinctive black pants and shirt and red and black checked kerchief, entered a capital where chaos and food shortages reigned. As soon as they were inside, although the inhabitants had poured into the streets to celebrate the liberation, they ordered them to evacuate the city because of possible U.S. bombing. They announced to them that they would be moved to a camp for a few days because of this. At the time, few suspected what was about to happen. The year zero had begun. The country's history was being written anew. That forced mass exodus had something disturbing about it. The orders were for people to leave on wagons or on the backs of animals, and for those who could not to leave on foot, even the sick and elderly. Within hours, Phnom Penh, one of the largest capitals in all of Asia, became a ghost town. Soon, the sidewalks were filled with the corpses of all those who had not withstood the march. The horrors had just begun. In the shadows, Pol Pot himself and his acolytes were hatching a mad plot. First, they changed the name of the country to Democratic Kampuchea. Three, abolition of an identity. The new ideology aimed to eliminate any trace of the odious capitalist past. All motor vehicles were ordered to be destroyed, and the mule-drawn wagon became the national means of transportation. Factories and libraries were commanded to be burned, and the use of drugs was banned, since Kampuchea was able to manufacture all the medicines needed for the people by drawing on folk wisdom. Spectacles were also banned because, according to the new political order, they elevated people to the status of intellectuals, a caste that had to be eliminated. In this ideal society, only the peasants were considered unharmed by the capitalist and bourgeois disease that, according to the leaders, had contaminated the country up to that point. They were the exemplary citizens. And the others? The others were dangerous vestiges of the past that had to be re-educated or eliminated. Pol Pot's first order was to kill all subversive elements. Thus it was that senior officials and military personnel were executed, and then professors, lawyers, doctors, and anyone who knew a second language. Spectacles were banned because, according to the new political order, they elevated the person to the status of an intellectual, a caste that had to be eliminated. Markets and currency were abolished. All religions, including Buddhism, which was prevalent in the area, were banned. The leaders of the Lan Nol regime were executed. The foreign population was expelled and all ties with the rest of the world were severed. To conclude the re-education program, the entire population was locked up in agricultural communes with the ultimate goal of multiplying rice production. Four, tool slang, the child torturers. Most of the executions were carried out at the tool slang camp, a few kilometers from the capital. The tortures practiced there make the Nazi doctors of World War II look like mere amateurs. In a display of sadism, prisoners, as soon as they entered, were pulled out their fingernails and then subjected to harsh and endless interrogations. To make the torture stop, the suspects had to admit their ties to the KGB, the CIA or General Knoll's political elite. In the end, all those few wretches wanted was to end their suffering and be executed as soon as possible with a blow to the back of the head. More than 20,000 people were murdered in Tool Sling. Only seven came out of that death camp alive. 
In tool slang, more than 20,000 people were murdered. Only seven made it out of that extermination camp alive. Today, visitors entering the Museum of Horrors that was once the prison cannot suppress a shudder at the photographs of the torturers. Wicked-looking teenagers, young men who had not yet reached their 20s and who were destined like beasts for one task, to inflict pain on their compatriots. Life in Cambodia became hell. Private property was drastically suppressed. No one owned anything. Even clothes, even the Khmer's black uniform and headscarf were owned by the Ankar, a completely abstract concept by which the Communist Party designated itself, a system of control of society, in short, a kind of big brother. Food was rationed and administered in the refectories, and owning a pot was considered a crime. Workers were dying of exhaustion and starvation due to food shortages and grueling days in the rice fields. Even showing grief over the loss of a loved one demanded punishment. It was a symptom of weakness. Food rations were so meager that some cases of cannibalism even occurred. Even sexual relations were regulated, and people were forced to marry just to bring new citizens of Kampuchea into the world. It was finally decided that each citizen had to produce two liters of urine a day, and that every morning he or she had to deliver it to the head of the community to make manure from it. Five, genocide without trial. Pol Pot created a generation of child soldiers, alienated and violent creatures who, after being brainwashed and severely indoctrinated, were capable of slitting the throats of anyone they deemed capable of betraying their leader, just for the guilt of stealing a piece of fruit or a handful of uncooked rice. They were even willing to report their parents for theft. Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge remained in power for 44 months, until Jan 7, 1979, when Vietnamese military intervention forced the genocidal man out of the country and into hiding in the wilderness. There are no exact figures on how many people lost their lives in the killing fields, the death camps, but it is estimated that there were more than two million. Pol Pot's lust for extermination went to such extremes that when he learned that some Cambodians had managed to escape to Thailand, he had 10 million landmines scattered along the border to prevent their escape. Pol Pot died on April 15, 1998, at the age of 78, in the thick of the Cambodian forest, a prisoner of the group he had founded 40 years earlier, the Khmer Rouge. This spared him from being tried for his heinous crimes. Official sources reported that his death was due to a heart attack. Others claim that the death occurred just as the Khmer Rouge were about to hand him over, leading to the assumption that he lost his life in an assassination attempt or through poisoning, although an autopsy of the corpse was never allowed to be conducted to discover the true cause of death. Eventually, the body of one of the most heinous genocides in history was cremated in a makeshift bonfire with cardboard boxes and old tires.